Okay, so we'll we'll start. This I'm Arnold Kling, and this is Eric Kaufman, and uh, both of us have have coughs, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll survive that. But uh, I think of Eric when I think of him, I think of somebody who uh, examines the fault lines in politics between young and old, uh, men and women, college educated, non college educated, religious, not religious. Um, and it's a topic that interests me a lot. He approaches it, I think, you know, quantitatively with surveys, uh, you know, real, real research. I approach it more anecdotally, and I want to start this with uh, a few uh, anecdotes. I might as well put myself on the screen. Uh, a few anecdotes that are from, from before Eric was born. Uh, to sort of make the point that these fault lines aren't entirely new, but uh, the the way they are operating uh, has changed uh, quite a bit. So the three uh, anecdotes, I want, these are like cultural touchstones. Uh, the first one is a movie called The African Queen, uh, which is a 1951 movie. And the next is... Uh, the book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is 1962. And then I'll get to a 1968 song and movie that uh, I'd be surprised if anyone remembers. Uh, but OK, so The African Queen in 1951 stars Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart. And in my memory, you know, she's very refined and sophisticated. And he's this rough hewn guy. She's chartering him to take a antiquated boat through the African wilderness. And, um, you know, again, she's very, you know, refined and uh, upper class. And he is uh, sort of, he's a he's a, he has mechanical skills. He can handle the wilderness and the, difficulties of the uh, of the African uh, scene uh, and they're you know they're thrown together and uh, you know eventually they uh, they fall in love and get married and this the movies didn't all end that way but there really were a lot of movies in that period that put together this refined upper class genteel woman and this rough hewn blue collar, whatever male, like, you know, just about any Western from that period would have had that. And, and lo lots of movies threw that together. And there was this dynamic of the, the, the woman and the man repel each other, but they find use for each other and need each other. And they, they reach some kind of terms of, uh, of getting along usually by the end. And it just, the echo today is the college educated woman and the non college educated man. And that's a, a huge political divide now. Um, and, but it doesn't look like they're going to uh, end up, you know, they're certainly not going to end up happily married. Uh, it doesn't look like. Um, and then the, um, so that's the African queen. The one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You know the story there is there's a a, a mental institution ward that's uh, dominated by a, this woman nurse Ratched, who uses uh, all sorts of sort of kind of, I'd call them you know female techniques of kind of repression or oppression. So if the guys so all the patients are um, are male, and she, in some sense, oppresses all of them. She even oppresses the male doctor. She she dominates over them, uh, and the way she does it is by like if if the guys want to watch a World Series game or something, she'll say you know if, tell tell them in effect that that's not appropriate that's not safe that it's maybe unfair that one person wouldn't be able to take advantage of it whatever so there and the modern echo of that might be um okay so wait sorry the the her opposing character is Randall McMurphy 
who is, you know, in, who becomes a patient at this place, uh, but who resists all forms of repression. And, uh, you know, he, he's not going to, uh, you know, obey her commands. He's very defiant, very kind of very male, uh, doesn't, doesn't get subdued. Um, and so the echo of that nowadays uh, might be the, you know, progressive Twitter versus Elon Musk with, you know, progressive Twitter playing the role of Nurse Ratched. And in fact, I think there are people in Silicon Valley who, who see Nurse Ratcheds everywhere. You know, they see them in you know in the mainstream media. They see them in the um, uh, in regulators and people. They call the PMC, the professional managerial class, uh, and they sort of see themselves as the Randall McMurphys. Um, okay, so that's one floor of the cuckoo's nest. And the next thing I was planning to sing, but uh, again, we both have coughs, <laughs> and mine, I may end up speaking. Uh, the, the this little snatch of a song. Uh, but uh, if everyone would uh, close your eyes and pretend that I am 20 years old <laughs> with long hair and a kind of sneering, defiant uh, tone of voice and, and pretend that I'm singing on pitch, which I may not be able to do. But uh, here goes. There are new dreams crowding out old realities. There's revolution sweeping in like a fresh new breeze. Let the old world make believe the blind, deaf, and dumb. But nothing can change the shape of things to come. Okay, so that is a song from a 1968 movie called Wild in the Streets. Um, and the, the plot of the movie is, is uh, there's this 20-year-old rock star who becomes a rock star slash political activist who becomes the leader of a revolutionary movement. And the revolutionary movement kind of takes over and shoves aside uh, everyone over 30. I think 35 and over, you get sent to a re-education camp. It's a very dystopian, <laughs> paranoid kind of uh, plot. And um, anyway, neither the song nor the movie did very well commercially, although they got pushed really hard. There was a lot of marketing campaign, which is why I remember them. Uh, the song was, you know, about as musically sophisticated as a 1950s advertising jingle. So it did, it, it, it deserved the the limited fate it had. I think the movie was bad too, but I never saw it. So I, I can't speak from personal <laughs> experience. Um, but I think it was definitely part of the 1968 zeitgeist because 1968 was kind of the peak of the generational conflict being uh, emphasized in the media. You know, 1968 is the year we're in the spring, at many college campuses, students took over administration buildings, and there, you know, there were confrontations all over there. And of course, 1968 is the year of the Democratic Convention in Chicago, where the yippies and uh, other protesters were were chanting and throwing things, and Mayor Daley's police went charging into these student groups. You know. Uh, you know, regularly on you know, more than one occasion in riot gear and chasing them down and beating them with billy clubs and so on. And this is a time when there are just three television networks and their practice was to preempt all their programming during a, con a major party convention and just, you know, have their cameras there and, and, and cover that. So, you know, no one could watch anything else on TV other than this, you know, this rioting by police and the demonstrators. Uh, so no one could, could watch anything else on TV. And you know, so it became the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. So there's that going on. And then this movie, uh, you know, sort of, I think, 
exemplifies the fears that old people had of, among other things, becoming irrelevant because the, you know, the young people at that time, those of us who were, you know, in our teens or early twenties, uh, were the baby boomers, so very numerous. So the, the main, I think, the main fear implicit in wild in the streets, it isn't just that the kids are, you know, have different ideologies. It's that there's so many of them. And the um, so there's no you know the, the the old people are going to be overwhelmed by the numbers of their kids, and I think that's a big part of the plot in the movie. Um, and nowadays, there I mean I'm just as scared of young people nowadays, <laughs> if if anything more scared because of what they believe. But the the numerical inferiority is not something I feel. I mean, I still feel like I'm part of a part of a big baby boom generation. Uh, and, you know, we're certainly not going to be dwarfed by the uh, generations that follow. So those are kind of three cultural touchstones to set the stage for this. Uh, I wanted for my first question, Eric, just to get you to give me the journey that got you to the point where you're the expert on political fault lines. I mean, when you were <laughs> 20 years old at, I think, Western Ontario, did, did you already have a plan in life that this was going to be your your, um, your area of expertise? Well, that, <laughs> thanks. I think you're uh, praising me too much in terms of being the world, the, the expert on fault lines. But um, I would say, I mean, my interest was more in the direction of, of uh, demographic shifts through immigration and the impact that that was having on uh, national identity. That was kind of my initial research. Uh, and when I went over to England, where I still live, you know, that that's what I focused on. Of course, what that takes in is what becomes the major fault line really in both Europe and, and in the U S as well, which with, with immigration is one of those issues that now very much separates partisans uh, in the U S case. It's interesting because it wasn't really till uh, the 2016 election that you saw immigration attitudes, you know, polarized. You something like 50 points difference between the, a white Republican and a white Democrat, whereas in 2012, it was only 12 or 13 points. Um, so I, I guess there's two stories. I mean, one is the polarization, which begins sort of in the 70s and 80s as people start sorting their uh, views on particular issues like the economy or abortion or aid to African-Americans into uh, ideologies like liberal and conservative, and then into parties like Democrat and Republican. And so there's there are charts in 1980 showing there's almost no relationship between the level of conservatism in a state and the Democratic or Republican share of the vote, you know, as late as 1980. And then by 2000, there's an almost, you know, the R squared, the dots are tightly, uh, the state, each state dot is really tightly on that line. So you're getting this process of sorting uh, that's occurring as people are starting to put, you know, because it used to be the median voter, the, the, going back to the early voting studies in the 50s and 60s, you know, the median American voter was conservative on the question of are you liberal or conservative, and they were a Democrat. So that was kind of the median voter. And then gradually you had this sorting process as people were able to sort of assign, let's say, the right issues to the right ideologies to the right party. And then into that, we've had different kinds of fault lines. So initially, maybe the economic uh, tax and spend versus free markets uh, was a bigger, as in Europe, as in Britain, that was a bigger fault line. And eventually what happened is that you had a cultural realignment. I mean, you had a little bit of that in the U.S., first on the race issue, then on the, with the religious right in the 80s. Uh, and, and to some extent, the 90s, but say, let's say in, in the period since the late 2000s, it's these newer sets of cultural issues, immigration, race, identity politics have taken on more uh, importance. And just a, a quick statistic, uh, the best question for picking apart a Republican and a Democrat now is um, support for Black Lives Matter. 
there's about an 85 point difference uh, in views on that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, out of a possible 100, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that kind of tells you really um, how this thing's evolved. Now, I'd also say that in Europe, uh, similarly, I mean, Canada, where I'm from, I mean, if you look at the views on immigration of conservative voters and voters for the more left wing parties like the Liberal Party, the New Democrats, the Green Party, as in the United States, there was about a sort of 13 point, 12 point difference until, let's say, 2013. And then by 2019, it's 50, 55 points. Um, and that's a country where immigration, there was no Donald Trump campaigning on immigration. So it was not an issue federally. This all happened in terms of switching and voter alignments going on in the background. And, and in Britain, it happened over the Brexit vote, which was basically a vote around the immigration issue as well, and in Europe with the populist right. So I think what we're kind of seeing is this, uh, and, and I just got, got interested in this, partly because I'd done all this work on the politics of immigration, say in the US in the 20th century, early 20th century, and then looking at the period up until say Pat Buchanan, but then um, that that whole question of the politicization of immigration then comes back in force with Trump. Whereas the question a lot of us were asking in the early 2000s was, it's quite surprising that there hasn't been an anti-immigration national politics in the US of any kind. This is really astounding given the demographic shifts <laughs> that occurred, particularly with the increase in Latin American share, uh, is very surprising. And so it's almost a dog that hadn't barked, and then Trump came along, and that was really answering that question. So I sort of decided to write my most recent book on, on this um, after Brexit and Trump. And, and basically, the argument is that the, the Trump and Brexit votes are primarily about culture and psychology and have very little do with, to do with people's class or income or employment or other economic factors then and, and that sort of um puts the conservative leaders in the u.s and england on the on the spot in the sense that the conserve the elites in the in both of those parties generally are not anti-immigrant but they're you know the the phenomenon of audience capture is going to make them uh, be that way. But I think, I mean, what I what little I've read, the Conservative Party in the UK is in dire straits in terms of polling because, you know, from the voters' point of view, the whole point of Brexit was to stop immigration, and that was that seemed to be the last thing on the leaders' minds in terms of implementing Brexit. Is that the right? Am I correct there? Yeah, you you've really put your finger on it. Um, and of course, yeah, so so immigration has been a key issue, both illegal and legal. Um, and you're right. I think the the Brexit voters for a while thought, okay, we've got Brexit. Now all of a sudden we'll have solved that issue. And then you had the pandemic, which meant that very few people came. Uh, but then it became more and more apparent that, you know, the number of illegal crossings of the English Channel had been, it was rising, and these people were winding up being put up in hotels at great expense. And at the same time, you had record numbers of, of uh, legal immigrants coming in. And yeah, I think there was, that really sort of exposed the dissonance between a very small Brexiteer libertarian elite, if you like, uh, who sort of had this global Britain vision and the vast majority of Brexit voters who didn't, who really didn't buy into that. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons the wheels have come off the Tory party. I mean, I should say the other thing in regard to some of the films you mentioned is there's now been a second issue, uh, which has arisen on top of the politics of immigration, which is the sort of moral or culture wars kind of issue around speech boundaries and the traducing perceived traducing of national history, which uh, with you saw that with a statue toppling uh, after the George Floyd rioting, which some of which came over to Britain as well. Um, and then you see it in the sort of uh, gender ideology and the equity and diversity that's coming through in schools and, and uh, government and so on. I think I think what's happening is that that that's sort of overlaid. So what you had was you had the populist uh, anti-immigration vote 
you then had the kind of progressive left pivoting towards identity politics, leveling these accusations of racism and, and deplorable. And in, in Britain, there was a, a few well-known incidents. Prime Minister Gordon Brown had called a, uh, a Northern English voter, a bigoted woman that was caught on, uh, uh, that was sort of caught on record. And, and that, he, you know, that sort of exposed the kind of fault, these new emerging fault lines. So for that progressive <coughs> left, this is the idea of wanting to restrict immigration is seen as racist and deplorable. And then, of course, the people who've been called a, a racist are going to react against that and say, you, these people are politically correct and so on. And, and now we're into a kind of second second order kind of moral conflict layered on top. And and how, what about the gender, gender slash educational attainment aspect of that? I mean, am, am I correct that there's just a, you know, where the, that this, you know, the genteel uh, high class woman and the uh, blue collar man just <laughs> don't get along anymore. Is is that true? And is that part of the division in in other countries, or is that just something that's U.S. specific? No, it's not U.S. specific. Uh, there is a a growing gender gap. I mean, Canada, I think, probably has a bigger gender gap. I'd have to look at the numbers. Uh, I think Canada's got a bigger gender gap than the U.S. in voting. I mean, where you really see the gender gap is in the young population, uh, so under under 30. Um, like in Canada, I think the uh, young women are or young men are twice as likely to support the conservatives as young women. I mean, so it's 50 to 25. I mean, it's absolutely massive. And, and can we can, can we do something with intersectionality there? That is the intersection <laughs> of of. Uh, gender and education and education is does that stretch the gap even further um god that's a good question I, I don't think education contributes a whole lot to that it contributes a very little bit i mean so for example amongst u.s undergraduate students um that, you know, FIRE, which is Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, they do massive surveys of the undergraduate population. You know, you can see there's a huge, you know, very big gender split uh, within elite undergraduates. So if you are white, male, you say your religion is Christian as opposed to no religion. So this is not being an evangelical, just this yeah. is just ticking the Christian box. Um, and you are attending an R1 university chances are you probably got a better than average chance of being Republican. These are people attending top universities. So they're educated, they're young, but they're not in that cultural left bracket. So I think, I don't think it's simply a question of educated versus less educated. I mean, that counts a little bit, but I'm not convinced that's really the key dividing line. Um, but it matters, of course, absolutely matters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw a hand there from John. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, yeah, we can open it up. Yeah, go ahead, John. Okay. John a. Open it up. Just a quick follow-up, if I may. Um, if you look beyond the R1, if the elite universities, uh, another factor is the gender gap in edu educational attainment. In the United States, I can't speak to Britain, but in the United States today, 60% of undergraduate degrees are, are attained by women and only 40% by men. Uh, I, I don't think I'm far off with that. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, so if, if you look at now at R1 universities, you're more likely to you know, have uh, some, some gender balance at the, at the most, they, they pride themselves on being 50-50. Even though, <laughs> even though the standard sex ratio is not fundamental for them anymore because of the fluidity of gender identity, they are <laughs> very hard to have 50% male and 50% female at Harvard. Um, well, you see where I'm going with this. If you, if you, if you, so if educated women won't marry educated men. I mean, uneducated men. Un yeah. un I'm sorry, uneducated. Uneducated men, thank you, thank you, Juan. 
then um, there might be this intersectionality that, that Arnold uh, Riley alluded to might, uh, might have a lot to do with political attitudes. That, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, uh, you're right that there's been this shift. It's happening also, by the way, in Britain and, and other countries exactly the same way. Um, and I, I guess there's two questions. One is how much education is tied to voting. And it's certainly got a stronger predictive power than income uh, in every country generally. So on the Brexit vote, you know, having a university degree really meant you were much less likely to vote for Brexit. However, the only point, so, so that's one question. The second is what you mentioned, which is this issue of the marriage market. Um, I, I guess I'm not enough, enough of an expert to know how much cross-class marriage is occurring. I, I, I suppose I'm more, I suppose, focused on the cross-partisan marriage question, in part because, I mean, if you ask women, uh, female undergraduates who did not vote for Trump, which is like 90 some odd percent. Uh, so if you ask the, those undergraduates whether they would date a Trump supporter comfortably, only 7%, 7 out of 100 <laughs> sort of reply yes. And, and even in going broadly, that more broader than the R1, I mean, it's less than I think 15 or 20%. So, so, and some of these dating sites have now got, a lot of them are now listing political affiliation. And, and so I, I, I guess I kind of would imagine that if you were, a, you could be a handyman, but maybe if you were a Democrat or liberal, then you'd be okay. Uh, I mean, but it, you're right, this is going to be really interesting to watch how it unfolds. It could be that people just have to settle, but then some people, I think I, I think I'm right in saying only 20% of marriages in the US, there's a cross-partisan couple. Um, and so, you know, is this going to lead to problems when you've got a big imbalance between the uh, female and male young population? Um, that's going to be interesting. And I'm not the expert on that. We, we're going to just have to see. And the dating sites are probably going to make this worse. All right. Uh, Dwayne, go ahead. Have a question. Great. Th Eric, thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, let's go back to immigration. And uh, I'm calling from beautiful, sunny Miami. We're, we're dialing in. Um, and we have no shortage of immigrants, legal and unlegal, mostly the latter. Um, I'm curious, Eric, you've thought a lot about this. And Arnold, you're welcome to chime in and anybody in this. What's the optimal? immigration policy for a developed nation, whether it's the UK, Canada, or the US? Yeah, oh, wow, well, okay. So I, <laughs> my, I, I guess my view is that you've, you've got to go to where the voters are in the sense. So they're gonna be voters who want it slower and those who want it faster. Um, and I think that in a democracy, we have to sort of find an accommodation. And, and my, my issue, I suppose, has been with attempts to shut down that conversation or to label anyone who wants lower numbers as a racist. And I think that kind of pressure uh, certainly was was there in Europe. Um, I mean, it, it was there until, to some degree, until populism kind of broke it up. So, so Sweden, for example... Uh, which has very high immigration or had high immigration and was getting increasing numbers in 2014-15. The interior minister, I think in 2013, from a, from the mainstream right parties, tried to raise the subject, was essentially hounded by the media. And so nobody could talk about it. And then the next year, the Sweden Democrats came in on 13% and they've done very well in the most recent poll. So yeah, I, I my only view on this is that you know, it's perfectly legitimate to uh, want lower numbers. And I'd also argue it's legitimate to want lower numbers for cultural reasons, not just economic reasons. Um, I, I don't think there's anything racist about that, but I think there needs to be an accommodation. So it's not going to be zero. It's not going to be open borders, but it'll, and, and so that's, that's my only plea. I don't have a, you know, a, a firm number in mind. Um, you know, I probably do incline more towards the, the lower number, uh, than the higher number, I suppose, in terms of my own predilections of things I value. Yeah. yeah, I think if it were up to me and I could ignore voters, uh, I would be uh, very much expanding legal immigration uh, and, and and not illegal. But 
Um, I think that the progressive left has sort of added insult to injury here in, um, I think, I forget what somebody's substack or something I read recently uh, had the term asymmetric multiculturalism, by which they meant uh, it's fine to venerate other cultures, but you have to hate your own, you know, if you're in the West. Mm -hmm. And that progressive attitude, you know, really makes immigrants way more threatening. It, you know, if if you you know if you're somebody who who values American culture, you know, traditionally the, your your idea was they they were going to assimilate to you, right? You so right. you know it, it was the assimilation model, and as long as you had the assimilation model, um, you know that people were reasonably happy with immigration. I mean, Ronald Reagan was pro-immigration. But uh, once you have this attitude of, you know, treating those other cultures as superior and, you know, you're tearing down the statues of your own culture, uh, that, that, you know, if anyone is inclined to see immigration as a threat, well, that just you know, triples, quadruples the, the level of threat there. So um, anyway, I think I think that's that's part of the context for this. Let me uh, call on Dennis Waters. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for uh, for being here and thank you for your work. Uh, th this group a few months ago had a very interesting conversation about uh, David Hackett Fisher's book, Albion Seed. Uh, talking about the, uh, the 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 cultural norms and the folkways that came down, depending on where uh, where in England various groups came from and what parts of the U.S. Uh, they uh, they uh, settled in, and and it seems like these are very persistent norms. And I was curious as to whether there's any evidence that you've seen at this point that the, that these norms are now weakening or the kind of trends that you're talking about are kind of washing over them in a way to, to bleach them out and make them less important today than they used to be. Eric, do you know that book? Yeah, I do know it. I do. Absolutely. I, I uh, looked at it quite a lot for my first book called The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America. I looked a lot at the Anglo-Protestants as a group. Uh, and I guess in terms of the culture, I mean, culture is quite a tricky thing, right? I mean, in terms of the honor culture, for example, of the South, which has been traced to some of these founding groups. Uh, I'm, you know, survey evidence I've seen, like from Robert Putnam, would suggest that that persists. I, on the other hand, I think there's an argument that one, there is an argument that suggests that the upland South, that Scotch, originally Scotch Irish upland South culture, uh, has become the nationwide working class certainly working class republican culture um and so even something like and and just by the, the way uh, thomas Sowell argues that it also became the black culture it's except that the blacks right. went to a different place politically yeah yeah i mean i guess so right so the question is how much so certainly though those southern migrants coming up the black southern migrants coming up to the northern cities carried it with them but i think the uh, Michael Lind and others would, you know, the argument is that, you know, you see, for example, the Confederate flag flown at county fairs in the upper Midwest uh, in rural areas. And 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 there's you know, country music and NASCAR and some of these cultural practices which originate in the, the South have become nationwide. Um, at the you same time, even the non-coastal California, from what I understand. Right. Whereas the New England uh, culture for for Linda has become more the um, upper middle class university educated culture again across the entire country. So you'd find that in southern university towns as and in Atlanta as much as you would in uh, Boston or or San Francisco. Um, so I think maybe that's how I'd see the culture having evolved. And almost these are almost two partisan cultures in a way. Uh, they they know, fought the Civil War. I mean they yeah. they were. Uh, although actually that's not quite true the uh the there there were some scotch irish on both sides actually they just liked right. fighting and some of them were <laughs> anti slavery uh and uh, but anyway yeah go ahead but yeah I, I, that that does seem to be the puritans against the the populace seems to be a uh, 
Yeah. You know. I mean, the other thing, of course, is that there's a difference between culture and what I would call kind of ethnic identity. Um, and so there is a question about majority ethnic, you know, what's happening to white identity, let's say, in the U.S. You know, you had these myths like Western Settlement and Plymouth Rock and um, Ellis Island, and you had these different settlements. And, and one of the... Another thing you're seeing, I've seen in surveys, for example, is that any, you know, people who are identifying could be somebody who's Hispanic or Asian or African American, but someone who sort of sees something like Plymouth Rock or Western Settlement as a positive part of their American uh, identity uh, is vastly more likely to be Republican. Um, and, and so you're also, I think, getting a, a, a splitting in terms of the usable past that each person identifies with so it splits in the content of, of their americanness um yeah so where do you where do you see like um do, do you think there'll be a major change in black voting i mean sort of culturally you know that they're in a lot of ways they would seem to be republican uh but by sort of history uh at least recent history democrat do you think that's that's going to tip in some way, go gradually, or not have any significant movement at all? Yeah. Well, I think the literature on that kind of shows, I think 2008 was the peak Black vote for the Democrats, and then since then it's been slipping. And one of the reasons is partly because uh, more, more Blacks are leaving traditional areas where they're under the sway of community structures, including the church or uh, other structures where you, you essentially can't be a Republican and be a, an African-American in good standing. Whereas I think if you're living in some suburb in Phoenix, then probably that doesn't matter anymore. So I think there's there does seem to be this drift towards somewhat higher uh, Black Republican voting um, as, as they're no longer under the same communal pressures when they're leaving Black area. So desegregation, I think. Uh, so that seems to be the one trend, whereas this the drift of um, Hispanics and Asians towards the Republicans is more, I mean, arguably more to do with substantive issues such as patriotism or, or hostility to immigration, these kinds of things. Um, I'm not yet convinced that we see those kinds of trends among Black voters, however, um, to, to the same extent. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. We're throwing random questions at you. Let's have okay. Tom Tom speak up. Uh, I, I have a question for Eric, but first I want to mention on the optimum level of immigration, I think uh, there's two issues of the illegal and legal and sort of like Arnold mentioned, I think the optimal level of illegal immigration should be zero and mm -hmm. everyone should be agreeing on that. And then right. there should be the argument about how much legal immigration or not uh, and of what types. Is it only the college educated doctors from Nigeria that uh, Americans want or do we want the you know, lowest IQ people who need the most help also or equally? Uh, and I think that we should get to a uh, also a, a fast legal immigration process. You can hear about um, married people who take two or three years to get their married spouse legally into America, where it takes two days for a coyote to bring him across. So that was the quick on the immigration. For you, Eric, you, you didn't mention with respect to culture, the uh, Rotherham, I think it was uh, um, huge sex grooming gangs and uh, the, the reality that many immigrants, especially Muslim immigrants, have very uh, misogynist and anti-woman and rape apologizing uh, cultures, which are considered acceptable and you're a bigot and a racist to criticize them. And you did mention Sweden, but I read that Sweden stopped tracking the uh, migrant status of rapists because too many of the Swedish rapists who are migrants 
and they wanted to defuse that immigration issue uh, with respect to rape. So could you comment on those? Yeah, I, and and um, I mean, I think there's a you know certainly a higher incidence of uh, the sexual grooming for prostitution of of minors uh, amongst the you know amongst Asian Muslim that that subgroup in uh, northern English communities. Um, yeah, but I think these are both examples of where political correctness, what I would call cultural socialism, this idea that. Um, equality of outcome for identity groups or protection from harm, including emotional harm of identity groups is the most important value. And so therefore that value takes precedence over other competing values such as safety, truth, freedom of speech, et cetera. And I think this is a perfect example of where this takes place, where fears of being accused of racist, of being a racist kind of led uh, people in government uh, and in the police to sort of not tackle this as forcefully a, as they would if the perpetrators were white Brits. Uh, even though it's come out, the media, I think, is still reluctant to, and the government is reluctant to really pay as much attention to this as it warrants. So yeah, that's a good example. And similarly, in the Swedish case, uh, you, you know, that that desire not to offend, not to emotionally harm, a, a, not to be therefore accused of being a bigot that seems to be leading to these sort of downstream effects. I mean, you see these all the kinds of these downstream effects. Uh, so I mentioned about fear of being accused of being a racist means we you can't have a discussion over immigration levels. Another is crime. You know, uh, if it's rape, if it's grenade attacks in in southern Swedish cities, um, you can't have a, a conversation about how effective is stop and search. Uh, you know, it, what it, it may have a racially disparate impact in one regard, but maybe it's got a racially beneficial impact in terms of making neighborhoods where minorities come from safer and allowing them to build businesses. And, and you know, so you, you can't really have uh, productive conversations about a whole series of very important issues when you have this wall of silence that's imposed by uh, this this ideology of cultural socialism, which I think is really the dominant uh, ideology in a lot of elite spaces in Western countries. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree totally with with those assessments. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I go back to that that term I just learned about asymmetric multi multiculturalism that you, you sort of, you, know, you venerate this culture that, uh, you know, is hostile to your values. Like if you're a feminist, you don't want you, you know, why, why are you you know, venerating and protecting misogynistic, you know, Muslim behavior. Um, you know, you, it just seems like it's so obvious, com obvious common sense that <laughs> assimilation is the solution rather than, uh, you know, the, the, this asymmetric multiculturalism. But, uh, yeah. that, but, but uh, you know, Here's where I go. What what's going to happen? Because because my guess is if you did your surveys of the under thirty, uh, you know, at colleges, um, you you probably wouldn't even find many of the males will, willing to stand up and uh, for uh, you know traditional culture and assimilation. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that the you know academia in academia. Uh, I've kind of been studying nationalism and ethnic uh, studies for a long time. I mean, assimilation has long been a, almost a swear word. Um, it, it's, got, it's got to be this idea of multiculturalism. And But of course, as you say, asymmetric. So ethnicity is great for minorities. It's terrible for majorities. Um, you know, where where does that go? I think it's it's true to say that amongst younger people on college campuses, I mean, there is a significant difference between say white male Christians and and the rest in terms of their views. So I don't think it is as monolithic generationally. I, I, there is a split. I think that's going to become, by the way, a, a very important, perhaps the most important political dividing line going forward, actually. I don't think they- Which one? Uh, what, what, what's uh, going to be the most important? Well, divide? these questions around what I call cultural socialism versus either free speech or some kind of defense of national traditions. And I, th I think that you see big age splits, but also within the younger population, big splits as well. 
So a, a question I asked recently on a survey was J.K. Rowling. Should she be dropped by her publisher? And amongst the under 25s, it's a 50-50 split. Now, amongst the over 50s, it's 85 to 5 in favor of rolling. But it's just to say that I don't think that young group, because a lot of them are online. And of course, the more heavily online ones lean right. So you have a, 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 a an issue where, depending on where you're getting your uh, news and, and information and culture from, you're going to be socialized very differently. Wait, so you said the... We were speaking correctly that the more heavily online lean right. Some surveys seem to suggest that people who get their news uh, online uh, do lean right. I mean, it's a very I guess but because think, you you yeah. can find you can find right wing sources online. It's harder, you know, if you if you just right. read the do the mainstream. But that's still a bit of a surprise to me. Um, well, I mean, the thing is that school university corporations, organizations, they're all going to have, be culturally socialist, right, in terms of their DEI policies. The message that you're getting advertising in pop culture is all going to be in that direction. So you would have to go and look at Rogan and, and Jordan Peterson and others, yeah. to, and you'd get a different message. Okay. Um, so, so where do you think that'll end up? Where do you think, you know, 10, 20 years from now, we're, we're going to be? I mean, I mean, well, I think but when, when I've I think, aged out and these these kids have grown up, where are we going to be? Well, I think the uh, problem of wokeness is going to get worse because on average, um, this these new generations, Gen Z and uh, the millennials are much more culturally socialist and less culturally liberal in the old mm. meaning of that term and or conservative. And so the net balance, particularly in the professional sectors, is really going to be moving towards the direction of more speech restrictions and more enforced diversity statements and all the rest of it. But I think electorally, nationally, this this kind of an issue will be a major, something like critical race in, and gender ideology in schools will be a major issue. Um, so this isn't just a, a little bit of a fight between sort of some oddball conservatives like me and the progressive <laughs> establishment that you you really could bring in a big popular electoral surge. So, so DeSantis isn't just speaking to, you know, the Claremont uh, right. political crowd. He, he actually would have some traction with you know what you know we used to call joe lunch bucket <laughs> yeah that's right i mean some of the certain data i've seen now in terms of how highly people rank culture wars issues um for republicans you know like from a list of 10 i would say 50 percent of those that i was surveying were placing culture wars issues in their top three like so that i mean this just is this would not have existed even a few years ago. And every every year, every six months, more people understand what these terms are. Now, of course, they are also weaponized and marketed politically. So critical race theory or, uh, you know, the trans activism or however this is phrased by uh, DeSantis or somebody else. I mean, yeah, they are powerful. The other thing is the population right now is two to one against the woke position on these issues. And so there's every incentive for an organized right of center party to campaign on these issues and try and raise their profile. And so parties can really raise the profile of issues. Like you take the European Union here in Britain, that was a low priority issue. Only a few percent of Brits cared about it. Uh, but then Nigel Farage and UKIP, uh, they said, well, if you care about something like immigration, you've got to care about the EU. Uh, and they were able to raise the salience of that issue. And similarly, I think uh, someone like a DeSantis who says, well, you know, if you care about uh, you know, crime and, and homelessness, illegal immigration, if you care about any of these things, you've got to care about the culture war, we'll call it critical race theory or whatever. Uh, I think there are these techniques to sort of raise the salience for voters of these issues. So yeah, I, I'm going forward. And, and if you look at newspaper coverage, it's just exploded. These terms have on both left and right, um, just gone up and up and up and up for for since about 2015. Um, so yeah, I think everything points to those issues becoming more important politically and maybe 
if DeSantis becomes the Republican uh, presidential candidate, he will really, you know, for example, if he successfully uses an anti-CRT, anti-gender ideology uh, appeal, um, that will be noticed by conservatives in other countries, and they're going to start to try and emulate. I mean, even now I notice in Canada where the conservatives have been pretty timid, the most recent, the new conservative leader has jumped on this Jordan Peterson affair with the Ontario, uh, call, I think the psychological licensing body, and made a video about it, right? So that's already now starting to permeate into electoral politics there so and, and i suspect that's coming in britain as well yeah okay yeah, yeah yeah go ahead john uh, you, you just made a case that political entrepreneurs say someone like a candidate like this governor and candidate like desantis and parties can can um induce polarization uh change the salience of of uh political particular political issues I'd like to ask you to go upstream. Uh, I, 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 I saw a week ago, you did a fascinating interview at GB News about the causes of wokeness, mm -hmm. the uh, causes of the, the broad change in, in attitudes, especially among young people. And if I understood you correctly, you're, you were saying that it's not indoctrination at university. It happens sooner at an earlier age, it's happening in great, what we call grade school in the US, um, uh, in primary and, and secondary education. Um, one hypothesis stateside is that the universities that train teachers, so at, in those particular universities, the teachers are being indoctrinated and then they bring it to the grade schools as, as, as primary teachers. Um, so this is sort of some indirect version of the tenured radicals hypothesis to explain wokeness. My intuition is that there might be some third factor that explains um, a broader cultural change that you don't have, that it is. So, so one approach seems to be to say, look, the upstream cause is education at some level through some mechanism. That explains wokeness. An alternative is to say that education is a dependent variable and wokeness has some broader root. And uh, the only thing that occurs to me, however, my instincts go in that direction, but the only one that, the only conjecture that occurs to me is a greater secular, just a more secular society. And, and, and then these attitudes become kind of justice of God here and now on earth. Uh, it's, it's a secular religion uh, anyway. Yeah, guess, that's an interesting- I'm, I'm, I'm pushing back a little bit on your, <laughs> yeah, explanation of wokeness and asking how you might react yeah. to that. Yeah, that I think that's an interesting argument. And I know Douglas Murray and a number of others have, have talked about this kind of void as, as producing uh, this effect. Um, and I'm, I guess, I, I guess looking at the data, I would say religion matters because people who identify as Christian are more likely to identify as Republican or in other countries as conservative. Um, but once you are a conservative or you're a, a, on the left, when, you know, if, if you are a Democrat and a liberal, but you're a regular church attender and believer, it's not gonna, it has no real impact on your likelihood of expressing a woke view. So, or, or for example, a church that's, you know, like the Anglican Church here in Britain, where uh, or the Episcopal Church in the U.S. that is essentially on the left in many yeah. ways. Th you know, politically, whether or not they are believers in in Christianity doesn't seem to make much difference. Uh, so I, I guess, and and also, wokeness seems to spread quite widely in less religious settings as well as or at least countries like France where religion has been down for a lot longer and certainly a case like Britain um, where they were already much less religious countries let's say than the U.S. Uh, but the populations weren't woke in the same way they are uh, now so I think I, I do think it matters but it matters mainly because Fewer Christians mean fewer uh, conservatives or Republicans, uh, but beyond that, I'm not sure that it makes a huge difference. I mean, I think the I think you're right about the this, this 
the ed schools in the universities, but I, I'd also add to that just the ideologies that are being peddled in the sort of soft social sciences and humanities, which then the graduates come out of those universities and they go into HR or compliance or com um, communications in different organizations. Um, and they bring these these views and ideas with them. Yeah. <laughs> I think it um, yeah, and so, um, and, and in the schools, but I, I think that, you know, in terms of the impact, um, we, I've got a report actually with Manhattan Institute on CRT in American schools. We trailed some of the findings that showed something like 93% of uh, American school children had encountered at least one of five critical race or gender terms from an adult in school. I mean, it's incredible the level of penetration, but what the report will also show is just how much of an effect that has on student views. Whereas the, and the what research- is that, And is that a big effect? It is a big effect. I, I probably can't give the full numbers, but it's it's not only an effect on their views on racial and identity issues, it's also a big effect on partisanship and general ideology. So, I mean, this, it does appear, yeah. Formal, in your, in your view, formal education is the main yeah. important cause of, of political and cultural attitudes. Yes, uh, it seems that the school is having a much bigger impact. I mean, the university studies tend to show very small and scattered effects. It uh, doesn't seem to be much of an impact, but the schools, uh, yeah. And, and I would also say that I've also done these survey experiments trying to, uh, you know, put a paragraph either pushing the DEI agenda or pushing the free speech agenda. And you only ever shift opinion amongst, a, you know, younger people. I mean, once people have certainly beyond the bachelor's degree there's there's it's very hard to move opinion i did manage to to shift opinion quite a bit in britain uh, for undergraduates uh but also for for school age so i think there's a certain degree to which they're open up until a certain age uh, so maybe if they get a heavy dose of learning about the first amendment in school and there's been studies that show in the us that kids that are taught the First Amendment, taught the law, become much more pro-free speech uh, later on. So those interventions, I think, have to come earlier rather than later. Wow. And the, uh, yeah, I, I, mentally, I, I, I'll have to go home and try to draw a causal map of all this stuff <laughs> because, you know, you know, sort of why, you know, why is Nurse Ratched uh, now in charge of the elementary school and in, you know, in, in so many other institutions, uh, you know, the, I mean, I can think of economic forces and, uh, you know, ideological forces. I, I'm a little sympathetic to John Alcorn's view of, you know, the, we're now uniting religion and state in some sense. All right, do you, Eric, if you have a few more minutes, we do. We have a couple more questions. Can you hang out? Sure, I can you... hang on for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So let's go with Dwayne. Uh... Great. So, Eric, let's stay with this concept of opinion shift, right? So, what we're, we're, we, we seem to be immersed, if you will, in two major areas of opinion right now wokeism and then climate change, right? These things are. They, they, they are enormous and they have huge amounts of momentum. Um, but, but at some point, I would imagine we have to focus back on economic growth as a critical issue for society more generally, right? So Brexit, it looks like the UK is likely to slip behind Poland in terms of its size of economy. Uh, the United States, we've asked the question, why did our growth fall from 3% to 2%? Are we in a period of great stagnation? Uh, does China emerge from three years of COVID lockdown and just like restart everything overnight? Like, is there, what's the thing, Eric? What's the thing other than, cl does climate change and wokeism dominate forever, right? Or is there a point where Gosh, I gotta get a job. I gotta pay my bills. <laughs> I, I gotta get married. I gotta have kids. Like, it, it, do we ever swing back somehow to the more traditional questions? And then finally, does, does something like Twitter does it does it live five years from now? But and again, that that's sort of with this with with the, how is this opinion gonna shift? 
Mike? Well, I, you know, you're absolutely right that those bread and butter issues matter. I mean, I think they haven't gone away and they still matter. And they're, they're absolutely central, I think, in the UK election now. I mean, so even though we've seen a realignment from uh, left-right economics to open, so-called open-closed cultural issues, I, I think those economic issues haven't gone away. I think actually because of the economic crisis uh, caused by Ukraine and, and the uh, pandemic, uh, that's actually put a damper a little bit on populism. I actually think we'd be having the national populist parties would be doing better because when voters are concerned about the economy, they're less concerned about immigration. They're less concerned about uh, cultural questions. So I think right now is a time when there is a lot of concern about economic growth. Um, I think if we were to return to a period of reasonable economic growth, I, I actually predict we're going to have more polarization and populism. So I guess my answer to you is in a way, if you think cultural issues are bulking large now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, so, uh, um, but yeah, of course. Now, the other thing I'd say is those issues are increasingly managerial issues, uh, economic growth. Everybody loves economic growth, just like everybody likes not to wait at the hospital. They want great public services. So people want it, their cake and eat it to eat it too. Um, I'm just... And if you look at the parties, like here in Britain, Labour and the Conservatives, there's almost no difference on their economic policies. The increasing convergence of uh, parties on economics, it's increasingly seen a lot more as a managerial issue and not as an ideological issue. So I, I guess well, the, I, I Liz, you know. Liz Truss tried to seem to try to have a radical difference in economic policy. But that had almost no backing in the in the voter base, like seven percent of UK voters back that a low tax uh, shrink public services, lower tax. That's very few voters. And also the markets pretty quickly disciplined that. So in a way, you don't have much room to move, I think, on the economic stuff. You There's only so much you're allowed to do by the markets and the voters. So I, I don't see it as an area where parties are going to distinguish themselves very greatly, you know, ideologically. Whereas the cultural stuff, the difference between, you know, recognizing that a trans woman is a woman and not recognize, and that's, you know, that's enormous. That's a real choice. So I guess I would see those issues as defining uh, political ideology going forward. Uh, and I don't see that going away. I see that intensifying actually. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, can we let's do a final question with Tom? If do, do you still have one? Yeah. That's, oh yeah. But a uh, real quick issue. You mentioned colleges in the U.S. Uh, I believe the colleges are coming from this woke stuff. But the reason is that uh, for fifty years or more, they have been slightly and slowly increasing their discrimination against hiring Republicans. And mm. so you have throughout all of the R1 colleges, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, all are anti-Republican. And this anti-Republicanism has allowed the, what I call now demonization. You know, in the, you mentioned Iraq a little bit, or Arnold did with uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, claiming it was Bush derangement syndrome when these uh, Democrats are almost hysterically criticizing Bush at every step. And it got even worse under Trump, the Trump derangement syndrome. But I think it's actually a demonization issue. And the reason it's demonization is that once you claim the other side is evil, then there's no compromise in between. It's a very binary yes or no. And uh, since they're the evil ones, has to be no against them. So yeah, uh, I, I think that that's a problem. Yeah, I, and I, I would very much agree. So I, I did a survey, a couple of surveys that showed 40% of social science humanities academics that I surveyed in the uh, top, sort of top 50 to 100 US universities, 40% uh, wouldn't hire a known Trump supporter for a job. Um, and in Britain, one third wouldn't hire a known Brexit supporter. Yeah, I mean, there's, and this is not just me, a lot of studies now confirm there's quite significant discrimination in refereeing papers, grant applications, and so on. Uh, so, so that's absolutely correct. Um, whether that on its own 
I, I'm not sure whether that on its own accounts for the, the rise of wokeness, but it is a factor, you're right, because there are fewer voices to put a check on the monocultures which generate radicalism. And uh, John Ellis in his book, Breakdown of Higher Education, talks a lot about this, how these monocultures, and Cass Sunstein as well, these monocultures lead to more extremism. Uh, so yeah, I think that's definitely a part of it. And, and also you mentioned this idea of the other party as evil. Um, so one question that I've pulled on, uh, if you take sort of white liberals under the age of 40 and you ask the question, uh, people who disagree with me politically are immoral. I think it's 44% of, in my sample, said yes compared to 26% of white conservatives and 0% of black conservatives. And so you kind of have this scale where it seems like Part of the problem, I think, is, is that because political belief and, 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 and moral belief is the sort of top identity for somebody on the left, whereas for somebody on the right, it may be nation or religion or locality. Uh, now, they still care about their partisanship, but it's mediated by another identity, whereas in the case of the uh, white, particularly white, not so much minority, but white leftists, they wouldn't have it mediated by anything. And I think that's part of why it's so important to them and drives their worldview to a greater extent. So yeah, I think this moralization of politics is a huge problem. That, that's sort of like Richard Hanania's, the, the left really just cares a lot more. <laughs> it's, it's your colleague there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think he's, he, I think, I mean, the, the extremes on the left and the right care more than the center, but you're right, the, the extreme left cares more than the extreme right, uh, at least in, in polling. And that makes it, and also the extreme left is, is tends to be better educated, better organized. So yeah, that combination of those things, I think does, does lead us to where we are. Okay. Well, I, I could probably keep <laughs> asking questions for an hour, but uh, I'm very grateful that for the time we've had, and I, I really enjoyed this discussion. I think it's been, you know, been, been one of the best discussions we've had, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks for all your great questions.